following program is recorded content created by the Truth Network. It's Matt Slick Live. Matt is the founder and president of the Christian Apologetics Research Ministry, found online at CARM.org. When you have questions about Bible doctrines, turn to Matt Slick Live for answers. Taking your calls and responding to your questions at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. Hey everybody, welcome to the show. It's me, Matt Slick. You're listening to Matt Slick Live. If you're a newbie, I'll introduce myself a little bit. I do that about every two, three weeks, I guess. I introduce myself for the newbies who might be listening. And uh, Matt Slick is my real name, S-L-I-C-K. Today's a wonderful day, February 8th, 2024. I'm a Christian apologist. I defend the Christian faith, answer difficult questions. Tonight, as a matter of fact, in three hours from now, which is 9 p.m. Eastern time, I'm supposed to be on, I'm going to make sure about this, uh, discussing uh, stuff with uh, on Seventh-day Adventism and what it teaches and some other issues and things like that. So uh, let's see, karm.org forward slash calendar. That's where you can find out about that. Karm, C-A-R-M dot O-R-G forward slash calendar. I don't know if that's on. T- oh, I don't have it on there tonight. i got to do that. And then um, on February 17th, I'll be in Draper, Utah, which is a half hour south of Salt Lake, and I'll be speaking on what does it take to defend the Christian faith. And uh, also, I just talked to Eric Johnson uh, about an hour or so ago. Eric's a great guy, works with Mormonism Research Ministry. He does these, by the way, he does these uh, these trips overseas, you know, Israel and, and um, Turkey and stuff like that. It, it, they're awesome. I, I've been on two of his. He does them a lot, uh, and he sets, sets them up and leads uh, groups over. So we're having a great time. He does that. But, um, oh, and his wife's awesome, too. His wife, Terry's great. I hope she's listening and smiling. So uh, t- um, Eric asked me, he said, hey, what do you think about, you know, what, what day are you coming down? I said, well, I'm coming down Friday, you know, and speak on Saturday morning. He says, what about uh, coming down uh, Friday early enough to speak, say, at 5 o'clock uh, at the, uh, the center, at the Utah Christian Research Center? And I said, sure. And I'll be talking on the Trinity. So I'm going to give a little 20-minute dissertation thing on the Trinity, and then if anybody shows up, <laughs> we'll see, because I don't know how it's going to be. Then um, I'll just do Q&A. So just so you know, I have been studying the Trinity a great deal, and uh, I've written on it, written a lot of articles on it. I've defended it numerous times. Now, I was doing a doctorate degree, and I dropped out because I, I, I'm just way overloaded with stuff. And I can't even keep up with stuff I've got here going. And um, But I was thinking about doing a dissertation on the Trinity as a necessary precondition for intelligibility and dealing with all kinds of stuff out of it. I mean, that's how much I'm involved with defun- defending and discussing uh, the doctrine of the Trinity. So, uh, you know, I really, really like it. Uh, I don't know why, but I, I, really dis- I really like discussing and defending the doctrine of the Trinity. I do. So anyway, if that sounds interesting to you, that would be, I'll do the Trinity thing, that would be on the 16th of February. So not, it'd be a week from tomorrow. You know, a week from tomorrow, I'm going to head down there and I'll come back on Sunday because I got to go speak at another place on Tuesday. So, uh, you know, got a lot going on. All right. All right. I think that is about it. And if you want to call me, 877 877- Two zero seven two two seven six, and if you want to email me, you can do that by just sending an email to info at carm dot org, info at carm c a r m dot o r g, and uh, just put in the subject title radio question, radio comment, or something like that. I can get to it. Let's get to Philip from North Carolina. Mm-hmm. Philip, welcome. You're on the air. Hi, Matt. Um, Hi. Thanks for taking my call. I, I I read the Bill Shorter commentary on Revelation, and I took the time doing it, and it led me to think, well, Phil, you need to be studying Daniel. So I read the, the Good commentary on Daniel, and then I got the Edward Young commentary on Daniel. Well, the reason I'm calling is that chapter 12, verse 7. I was hoping you could like read that and shed some light on it. 
And if you've read commentaries on this, on mm-hmm. Daniel, you could shed more light than I could, but I'd be glad to read it. Uh, and it says, I heard the man dressed in linen who was above the waters of the river. You're breathing into the into the uh, mic, just so you know. I heard the man dressed in linen who was above the waters of the river as he raised his right hand and his left toward heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it would be a time, times, and half a time. And as soon as they finish shattering the power of the holy people, all these events will be completed. So... Pre-tribulation rapture or tribulation period—is that what they're looking at? At this, is that what they're saying? Um, well, I'm I'm no kind of guy, and um, you know, it, the the disciple when Christ was arrested, it's like the disciples were scattered, and I'm wondering, all these things will be completed. Um, so mm-hmm. much of the prophecies in Daniel are talking about Antiochus Epiphanes. Yeah, Antiochus but Epiphanes, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, so much of this stuff is kind of reviewed in Revelation. And so I'm thinking, well, and I had a professor long ago who kind of led me to believe that the prophecies are fulfilled in kind of repetitiously. But he died, okay. and I can't get his insight on it anymore. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so, did he mention the word heptatic, uh, which is a cycle I don't remember of seven? That. Okay. Did he say Revelation was mm. in a, a, in a group of sevens? I'm just curious. Okay. Because oh right. A, because there's a view of Revelation that says it's uh, seven churches, seven spirits. And seven views of the same thing. That's what, uh, okay. and there's some interesting inter- information on that. So, uh, when he says all these things are, you know, in cycles, repeated, that, that would fit that model. Okay. So, as far as this goes, I've heard this so many times, but used, and I don't know if it is or isn't, but so many times used as a, a justification for the, uh, Great tribulation period, or the you know, and then when these things are completed, it's going to it's going to hit the fan. The first part of the seven years, so time, times, and half a time, so a year, year, and half a years, or something like that. Time was it time times plural, and uh, half a time. So a time is singular, times is plural. So that's, they say two, so it's one plus two, and then half a time. That would be uh, half, so that's three and a half, and that's one of, one of the reasons they well, say. Well, uh, see, Young said that. When time, times, and half a time was used the first time in Daniel, it was written in Aramaic, and it, all that was one word. But then, by the you, oh. time you get to chapter twelve, it's written in Hebrew again, and so it's a different word for time, times, and half a time. And that in, in itself is a little puzzling. Well, when someone says it was originally written in Aramaic, uh, they may know something I don't know, but I want to say. Okay, is it is this a place in Daniel where it's written in Aramaic? Uh, yeah, no. Yeah, and so if it is in the Aramaic in the actual text, then okay. Uh, so is this something I'd have to study and and see? But uh, anyway, well, I don't know if we've concluded anything. And you are totally breathing into the phone there, guy. Um, so <laughs> Sorry. is there is there something? I mean, well, I'm not sure what to ask now. <laughs> <laughs> well, because the what, what about of the it? holy people is what disturbs me. Because I mean, I'm the power of the holy people. It's like the Holy Spirit is the power of the Holy Spirit, right? I mean, the well, the, yeah. the Holy Spirit is the power of the but holy people. The word there is hand in Hebrew, yad, and uh, that's what the notes say. And uh, consecrate it's translated as times time power eight what what six times oh tenons oh I see the side that's the thing about Hebrew is it can be translated one word can be translated many different ways so uh, shattering of the power of the holy people uh, but my note says literally hand so that's oh. what you know. So it's like, okay, say hand or the power of the people. Well, they, people can have power. They, yeah, we understand the Holy Spirit is power of, of things, but people can have power too. They can have an army. You know, they can have 
nukes. You know, they could have all kinds of stuff. So uh, just not sure well, what I meant by that. Reading Young, I got the impression that there's all these well-educated people all through history that have differing views. And so if I'm confused, yep. I feel like, well, it's not that big of a crisis. You know? That's right. Um, I totally agree that there have been excellent scholars all throughout history who have got different opinions. And that's why a lot of times with something like this, if I've studied it recently, and I remember I'll say, well, here are the views that scholars have said. And then I'll say, I don't even know which one it is or whatever. And that's how it often is with with uh, prophecy. But what I think is also interesting in Daniel chapter 12 is uh, verse 4. But as for you, Daniel, conceal these words and seal up the book until the end of time. Many people will go back and forth and knowledge will increase. Did you study that verse yeah. also? What that might mean? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Tell me what yeah. what'd they like, say. Um, they may be traveling back and forth pursuing knowledge mm -hmm. and some say um, some say traveling back and forth implies great distances and knowledge will increase which is what's happening now so some are saying that it, it could be fulfilled now you know there's just so many views I wish I I wish I was an expert on it but I, I don't and if I were an expert on it I bet you I'd be saying the same thing I'm saying now well here's a view here's a view and here's a view you know well, you've helped me a lot with other things, and uh, I, so I just wanted one. to run that by you and see yeah. if you had um, more to help me get clarity of mind over it. Well, I wish I was able to help you more. Um, and I just, uh, I just, I don't know. You know, I, you know, I'm familiar with a lot of stuff in Daniel and Ezekiel and Revelation and Matthew and stuff like that, but it's. I'm so busy yeah, defending the faith. Well, see that word shattering? Uh -huh. I've seen footnotes where it said scatter, scattering. And well, so somehow I came across that thing uh -huh. about the disciples being scattered when Christ was arrested. Well, uh, it says in the, uh, I'm looking at the word, it's uh, nafatz in Hebrew, and it's translated as break in pieces nine times, scatter, this is in the King James, uh, scatter three times, break three times, dash, discharged, dispersed, overspread, dash into pieces, things like that. So it has that kind of a meaning. They finish shattering, scattering. Yeah, I think both of those work. Okay. And so that power they're talking about, that may not have anything to do with the Holy Spirit, I guess, right? It may not. That's right. Okay. There's all kinds of nuances. You know, I remember reading once, or hearing, or I can't remember now, it's been so long. In Second Thessalonians 2, for example, just as you hear these little things and you go, whoa, that's interesting. What does that mean? How does it affect stuff? And so in Second Thessalonians 2, it talks about the uh, he's held back until the one who restrains uh, is removed and uh, that what restrains him now so that in his time will be removed and the word restrained in the second usage I gotta find it me uh, when he's taken out of the way me doesn't yep. mean removed and doesn't exist but can be like you're in a doorway, you're still in the doorway, you just turn aside so someone can pass through and you're still there. See, all these little nuances. Uh, so, hey, hey, there's the music. Hold on, buddy. Hold well, on. see, we that's, that's we got a break. Hold on. about the Hold on, we got a break. Thing. Hold on, we got a break. Okay, so, hey, folks, we'll be right back after these messages. Please stay tuned. Matt Slick Live, taking your calls at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. All right, everybody, welcome back to the show. If you want to give me a call, all I have to do is dial 877-207-2276. Let's get to Philip from North Carolina. Philip, welcome. You're back on the air. I guess we lost him. Well, we'll see. I'm here. Oh, I got, I got to hit Hello. the right button the right way. Um, <laughs> right to where were we? So I read a little bit of a commentary during the break on that on uh, Daniel twelve seven, and it was uh, this one was saying that the Antichrist 
when he comes into um, Israel. Okay, so there's supposed to be a an attack on Israel, and Israel's going to defeat, or the Antichrist is going to defeat the attackers. There'll be a, a tribulation period, or the, the seven-year period set up, and in the middle of it is when he starts attacking uh, and going really foul, attacking Israel. And persecution will be huge. And that's when Israel's power is broken. So that's what another commentary said. Oh, okay. So, yeah, there's lots of views. Yeah. Well, you mentioned the restrainer thing from Thessalonians. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That is, that's the one thing about the Amil belief I've got that puzzles me. You know, the pre mill people, they're like, oh, well, we'll all get raptured and then the restrainer will be gone. Yeah. And so I wasn't sure how an Amil person looks at that. Well, I'm Amil, and how I look at it is, excuse me, I look at it as there's going to be a seven year tribulation. And the Antichrist is going to uh, make a covenant with Israel. There'll be peace for three and a half years. And then the Antichrist will attack Israel, uh, start persecuting them and the Christians. And that is going to get so bad that the nations, uh, the world nations, are going to come together in Armageddon. Uh, Armageddon, okay. the valley. I've been there. I've seen it. It's amazingly big and flat, like a, like a, a round f a dish. Uh, 30 miles across, 40 miles across, and uh, it's, it's it's kind of flat with this ridge on the outside. It's interesting. And so they'll come in and battle. And in my opinion, this is just my opinion, that uh, Genesis 2.17, when God said to Adam, the day that you eat of the fruit, you will die. I believe he was uh, talking not only to Adam, but to all mankind. The wages of sin okay. is death, Romans 6, 23. And in Matthew 24, 22, Jesus says, If those days be not cut short, no flesh would be left. So my conclusion is that things are going to get so bad, there's going to be a gigantic celestial I told you so that started in Genesis okay. two seventeen, And that uh, when the Antichrist and the nations come to war and, and, and everything, that it's going to basically uh, culminate in the destruction of, of mankind you know through nukes or plagues or whatever it's going to be and jesus is going to stop it he's going to come back and then the first ones taken are the wicked they'll be removed okay that's what he says in matthew thirteen thirty, and uh allow both to go together till this time of the harvest i'll say to the reapers first gather the tares and then he says uh the harvest occurs at the end of the age and there's only two ages this age and the age to come so uh, then, Thank you. then, and with that, uh, then the new heavens and new earth are made, and so that's my position. Right or wrong, that's okay. my position. Yeah, so that's how I see it. Well, thanks again, and I'll get off the phone and let somebody else call you. <laughs> There's nobody waiting. So okay, a lot of people they like to hear this kind of conversation, different views, because it's going to relate to everybody. What's going to happen? And um, there are different views, you know. What I'd like to do is not do a debate, but a, a back and forth discussion on point counterpoint uh, for the pre mill versus all mill versus post mill. Here's how we look at this. We're so very friendly, and people can just hear different perspectives and uh, stuff like that. I think that'd be informative because, in my opinion, these views, these views, I just don't see how anybody can absolutely definitively say which is correct. We can say we believe this is correct for these following reasons, and then we just go with that. that that's you know, that's what I would say. So, all right. Hey, folks, if you want to give me a call, all you got to do is dial 877-207-2276. I want to hear from you. Give me a call. And uh, also, you can email me by just sending an email to info at carm.org, info at carm dot org c a r m dot o r g and just put in the subject line there uh, just put in um radio question or radio comment i'm thinking of something here that's why i got i'm kind of stalling a little bit um so i, I have a, a link where i got to be on tonight and let me see if I get some other information about it so i can tell you guys where it's going to be tonight it's not a big deal i'm just going to be online and uh, let's see, go over here. And man, I got so much going on. 
All right. So that web see the website. Okay, I think I got got it here. Answering Advent Answering Adventism dot com. Answering Adventism dot com. So if you want to check it out, you can. And I'm looking at the site right now. And so uh, they have too many disparate contrasting colors. Uh, and so, and nevertheless, uh, I'm supposed to be on tonight. And I believe that's at, <laughs> I got to look here again. I got so much going on. Uh, yeah, it'll be 8 p.m. Eastern time, which is 6 p.m. my time. So he's, he's okay. We'll talk on cults and SDA doctrine and see how they match up. And uh, so there you go. That's what it is. Okay. So that's uh, answeringadventism.com. That's where it's going to be on. And I assume that they will have some link or something, or I assume that they're going to do something like that, that you can watch it. Uh, maybe it's just a private thing and then they do something with it later. I don't know. But it does say YouTube at answeringadventism. Do you have a YouTube thing? Yeah, there it is. I'm looking and learning. I got so much I'm doing. Oh, man. I got so much I'm doing. All right. There we go. Hey, I think what I'll do now is simply get on the emails. All right, because we don't have anybody waiting right now. So if you have a comment or a question, you can um, you can email me or you can, you can uh, call 877-207. 2276. So let's get on here with radio questions and comments. Uh, okay. I'm reading that. Uh, won't get into that one. Let's try this. I have a follow up or further clarity question regarding 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I've heard you dismiss the need to submit to the command for women to cover their heads while praying and prophesying. Uh, not, I don't just dismiss it. Uh, that's not it. Um, I I struggle with it, and it does talk though about because of the angels, and this seems to be non-cultural. So it, there could be a case made that women need to wear something over their heads as a symbol of authority. But then again, on the other hand, the issue deals with. Uh, the authority structure that was in place in the culture at the time. So since that's not there, then they don't need that symbol of authority. That's These are the two major issues I've had to deal with, and I've read commentaries on, on them, and uh, they have differences of opinions on these things. Nevertheless, we have a break coming up, bottom of the hour. If you want to give me a call, 877-207-2276. We'll be right back. Please stay tuned. Matt Slick Live, taking your calls at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. Everybody, welcome back to the show. If you want to give me a call, 877-207-2276. All right, I think I'm going to get back on to the, uh, the radio questions and stuff like that, because we do get those. All right, so this guy was asking that about First Corinthians 11. It says, are you, am I outright dismissing any and all application of Paul's command in today's context? No, I'm not. Or are you saying women can and should apply a parallel symbol of rank subjection? I, I'm saying I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I don't know to do with it. And, um, and I could go through the text and explain why, but there is this issue of uh, head coverings. And as a matter of fact, when I revisited it uh, about a month or so ago, um, I remember thinking, you know, it, it, we can make the case very easily that women should have head coverings in churches. And it says, uh, it says uh, in First Corinthians eleven three, I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of every of a woman, and God is the head of Christ. All right, headship. Every man who has something on his head while praying or prophesying disgraces his head. So one of the issues here is, is a man allowed to wear a hat in a church? And, well, then by this we would say, well, he can't. He goes into a church, he has to not have a hat on. 
and I, I would assume reading glasses uh, would not uh, fall under that uh, category. Every man who has something on his head while praying or prophesying disgraces his head. And what does it mean to disgrace his head? Oh, see, it's a whole other thing. But every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head, for she is one and the same as the woman whose head is shaved. Now, what this is talking about, whose head is shaved, is the dealing with the prostitutes who would have their heads shaved when they were busted, or certain wives when they were caught done doing some very bad immoral stuff, uh, sometimes would have their heads shaved. That's what I understand anyway. So this is why it's like it's so hard to sift out of the actual text how much is just cultural and how much is theologically required that's why i'm saying it's just difficult to do so uh there's more to it. we got callers let's get on the air with chuck from dayton ohio uh chuck welcome you're on the air hi welcome hi. hey um I I really got a, a a different question that's more uh, important to me than the one that I gave the fella that answered the that's phone. Right. But I just asked him a, a question about amillennialism because I thought that was a topic. That's all right. Could, but you want to I talk have about, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, it, it's about vows, like in Numbers, uh, uh, I believe it's thirty verse two, something like that. Okay. That if you make a vow to the Lord and you don't keep it, that he's, you know, pretty disappointed in, in uh, a person being a fool to do that. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's correct. And I've, mm -hmm. I've done that uh, more than once. Done what? As far as, as far as, you know, promising the Lord something and then not uh, keeping it. And okay. there's one vow in particular that I made uh, a long time ago that I, I just, you know, I'm, I'm on and off on it. And here lately, I've been trying really hard to keep it, and I just can't do it. Don't make vows. That's my solution. Don't do it. You see... Um, when my wife and I got married, we went through the traditional uh, ceremony, the traditional stuff, and the traditional vows. And one of the things that the preacher told us beforehand was in, that in the vows was the uh, admonition for her to love, cherish, and obey. And I asked him to take that out. And I said, the reason I want you to take it out is because I don't want my wife to vow that she will obey me, you know, whatever. And if I say to do something or request or whatever, she doesn't do it, then she's in sin. And so I, I said, you know, let's get rid of that for that reason. I take it very seriously. If you're going to, if you are going to, if you're going to get a vow, you can say your word, you need to do it. You need to take care of it. And so the solution is don't make any. Just don't do that. Let your yes be yes, your no be no. Because you can very easily break your vows and commit sin. So let's just say that you did and you committed sin that way. Uh, then the thing to do is go before the Lord and just confess it. And you'll be forgiven. And don't make any more vows. Just continue on and say, Lord, I will try to do such and such. Don't say, I will. Because you don't know what you're capable of doing. And you don't want to boast in your pride. I'm not calling you prideful and stuff, but you don't want to be prideful, you know. And so this is why it's, the whole thing's difficult. It's difficult to deal with. And that's why I recommend that. Okay? Does that make sense? Yeah. This is this. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And you got to understand something, though. You know, if you have made a vow before God and you've broken it, uh, God's not going to condemn you to hell, but He can discipline you for what you failed to do properly. And what you do is you just go talk to Him, and you be forgiven uh, by Jesus. You be forgiven by the Lord. You go talk to Him. That's what you got to do. And don't make any more vows like that. 
just say, Lord, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try, you know, and just strengthen me in it. Because I, I just need your help. I need your ability, not mine. And that's what you do, okay? Yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah. That's what I've been doing here, and uh, you know, I, I, uh, I feel really bad when I, when I don't. Even now, I, I feel bad when I don't uh, keep the the promise that I made. And I was pretty, I was a pretty young Christian, and I didn't really understand all this stuff. But I know from studying that that's no excuse. Well, here's the thing. I would, um, like I said, I would talk to God about it and confess you made mistakes you blew it you were immature and just ask him to release you from it and that you're requesting a release because you want to be able to walk with him without inadvertently sinning and that you you just want to do that i remember once i asked god to teach me (laughs) patience I, I asked him to reveal to me my sinfulness is more accurate what I did. Please reveal to me, Lord, what, how sinful I am in di- different ways. And I can take you to the location in San Diego where I was when I prayed again and asked him to stop because it was so powerful and because so much was going mm-hmm. on. And it wasn't me breaking a promise it was just lord i can't it's too much for me to bear and i asked yeah. him to be merciful I, yeah yeah okay. that, yeah that's what you gotta do yes right. yeah okay thank you very much god bless you brother all right well does that help you though does it yeah i think so yeah okay well good i want it to all right, I want to help you, and uh, I don't want you to be racked with guilt, and at the point where you can't function, I don't want that. I want you to be able to be free in Christ, and just, and I always tell people, yeah, you blew it. Now what do we do? Now what we do is, we talk to God about it. We get it taken care of with Him, and we move forward, and He remembers our sin no more, and that. He is that faithful to us. Okay? Yeah. All right? Um, Brother, look, I just hear it in your voice, and I just want you to know, look, he loves you, and he saved you. And how you blew it, and you know, we've all done it, but how you've blown it is not going to separate you from him. You're okay. He loves you. He's not going to, you know, spank you and send you to hell and all this stuff because you... You blew it. All right? Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. Does that help? Yeah. You know, uh, yeah. You sound distressed. I'm, I'm, well, I'm going through a lot right now. My wife is, uh, we got to go to a uh, hospital in Indianapolis Monday, and she's got a, uh, nodule on her lung that they're going to um, do an endoscopy to check for cancer and the, her pulmonologist said that she got like a 95 percent okay. chance that it would be cancer so just okay, a lot hold, i've hold been on. helping her we got, we got a, a hold on time. chuck chuck we got a break what i want you to do is stay on and then we're going to talk about this and i want you to find out i want you to call you back in a day or two let me know what happens but hold on buddy we got a break it's a hard break you got to go so hold on Hey folks, be right back after these messages. It's Matt Slick Live, taking your calls at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. All right, everyone, welcome back to the show. Last segment of the hour. Let's get back on with Dayton. I mean, with Dayton. With Chuck from Dayton, Ohio. Chuck, you still there? Hi. Hey, brother, you still there, man? Yeah. Yeah, okay. thank you. Hey, look, man, the, reason, the break was at an unfortunate time, but that's okay. We work around it. What I'd like you to do is um, is know that uh, we've got people praying for you, 
and we have uh, Joanne, and she runs the prayer team here on at CARM. So when you go and you find out about your wife and everything, I'd like you to call back and tell us what, what's going on because we're the body of Christ and we want to bear one another's burdens as Galatians 6 2 says and so if you would be so kind you don't have to of course but if you want you feel good enough about no, it no I appreciate you, it yeah you can do that okay let us know and we'll pray and people will pray for her and for you I could hear it in your voice and uh, the Lord will be with you in fact if it's okay I'd like to pray for you and your wife right now if that's okay I appreciate okay. it. Thank you. Well, sure. Here, yeah. let, me, let me lift her you name, up, all right? Her name's oh, Patty. Her name's Patty, and you're Chuck. Okay. Yeah. All right. Lord Jesus, I just want to lift up uh, Chuck and Patty to you right now. They're both under a lot of stress, a lot of strain. Uh, there's so many things that they don't know about, and they're going to find out about medical stuff, and vows made and broken, and so much. I ask, Lord, that you would lift them up to yourself and that they would rest in you completely and totally to let all the things, all these concerns to fall upon you in your lap and you would take them. And ask, Lord, that you would heal Patty and that there would be no uh, cancer at all, that everything would be fine and that you would also deal with Chuck uh, lovingly and patiently and that you would minister to him, Lord Jesus, and that he'd be a good, strong husband for her. And no matter what happens, Lord, that he would look to you and she would too. We lift this all up to you in Jesus, yes. in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay, brother. Thank you. All right. Yeah, thank you very much. Sure, no problem. Um, just let us know how it goes. You don't call back and, and you find out when you're able to. All right? Okay. okay, I will. Thank you very much. You're welcome very much. All right. All right, well, God bless. Okay. God bless. God bless. So, folks, lift up Chuck and, and his wife, Patty, and uh, just ask that the Lord would bless them and be with them and comfort them during this difficult time. It is a difficult time, and please, as uh, the members of the body of Christ, we lift people up and we pray for them and seek uh, to lift them up before God. And that's what we're doing, okay? So there you go. All right, hold on a sec. Get a cough. There we go. Oh boy, sorry about that. All right, let's get to Scott from Spokane, Washington. Scott, welcome. You're on the air. Hey, how you doing, brother? Doing all right, Scott, man. How are you doing, man? I'm doing good. I'm actually uh, visiting some family in Everett right now, actually rekindling a relationship with my little brother. It's been going really well. Um, so that's just great. I think you and I talked a little bit about that situation when we were together last. But, um, yeah. but yeah, so that's good. I just have a question or two. And so, you know, I've always heard that, and I actually believe a certain thing because of it, when it has to do with Genesis 6, is sons of God, that term is only ever used for angels. But I think I may have found a place where it's used of men, and I wanted to ask you your opinion on it. Yeah, the term "son of God" has different usages in different contexts. I've done study on it, and uh, it, you, and in fact, "sons of God" is used uh, for you're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus, Galatians three twenty six. But anyway, go ahead. What were you going to say? Well, I was just going to say, um, you know, I'm reading Deuteronomy, and in Deuteronomy fourteen one, um, it looks like it's they're being called the sons of Yahweh. And uh, mm -hmm. so I thought it was, you know, maybe or maybe not significant. And, well, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, it's just talking, he's talking about uh, uh, the Israelites. That they, It's just a, a familial way of speaking about their relationship with him. You know, your sons of the Lord and your God. And it just means, uh, you know, they're, they're the children of Israel kind of thing. And, and he gives them a warning, you know, don't cut yourselves. Don't shave your forehead uh, for the sake of the dead. Don't do the same for the sake of the dead. Things like that. So. Okay. Um, do you got time for one more? Sure. No problem. Okay. So the other one I have is also in Deuteronomy. Obviously, that's where I'm at right now. <laughs> um, so Deuteronomy 13, verses 6 through 9. 
Oh, and 13. here it's yeah okay. 13 6 through 9 and god here is you know uh commanding israel that if even if you have a, a very close friend or a relative who tries to lead you after other gods secretly mm-hmm. it's saying that you should be the first to uh you know oh. take them out and mm-hmm. um what i'm wondering here is does that mean on the spot or do you have to go to a council first, etc.? Well, it says, uh, you shall surely kill him. Your hand shall be first against him to put him to death, and afterwards the hand of all the people. So all the people means that he's tried, that he's brought before the group of people with charges, and that you, if you're going to bring a charge against him, you've got to throw the first stone. So this is an admonition both to caution as well as severity. And the reason God did not want the Jews to be involved with idolatry is because they would then uh, start taking in the practices of the pagan nations around them. And God had called Israel to be separate and distinct from those nations so that through their holiness, as they represented the true living God, they would be the people through whom the Messiah would come. And the Messiah is the only way, Jesus, of course, the only way that we can have our sins forgiven. So, comparatively speaking, if you look at eternal damnation and a a temporal destruction, a temporal issue is nothing in comparison to eternity. So, the severity that God is instituting there is for ultimate the ultimate reason of providing a guarantee of the arrival of the Messiah and symbolizing and practicing holiness that God Himself is. So if you're going to bring, and in that context of the Jews under the theocratic system, if they are, if anybody's going to bring a charge against somebody that they are worshiping a false god, others have to be involved because by the people, and you've got to be the first one to throw a stone to kill them. Is this is this what you really what you what you want to do? You better be careful of it. And if it is justified, and then the rest of the people agree, then you throw the first stone. That's what's going on. It's a tough one. Okay. okay, and then you know, the last one I have is pretty simple. What, what's the difference between docetism and Gnosticism? Gnosticism, uh, from the Greek gnosko, to know, and docetism comes from the Greek dakeo, to seem. So to know and to seem, or to appear. Gnosticism is the, the philosophical position of of teaching that there's secret knowledge, secret words, secret code, secret this and that, that certain people have knowledge of, gnosis, Gnosticism. And so there was called the Gnostics. And then Docetism is a heresy that taught that uh, Jesus only appeared to be human, but was not really human. He was divine, but not human. And so uh, it's called Docetism that he only appeared to be that it seemed as though he was the case okay okay cool thank you okay well, you got anything else uh yeah one more um okay. just, uh, sure, so no first problem. timothy six ten. Mm-hmm. this is the verse about you know money being the root of all evil i'm just wondering in the greek does it say root of all evil or does it say all sorts of evil uh the Greek word there is uh, the root of all uh, evil, and uh, it's panton. Uh, so it just it comes from the Greek uh, word pas, which just means all. So the word sorts is not there. All sorts of evil, uh, and ESV is all kinds of evil, and uh, King King James says all evil. King, New King James, all kinds of evil, RSV, all evils, LEB, all evils, all kinds, with NIV, CSB, okay, is all kinds. So um, both are correct. See, evil is, I mean, money isn't the root of every evil that exists. So when Satan fell, uh, in the pre-existence, but, you know, I mean, before pre-existence, wow, oh man. Um, when <laughs> Satan fell before we existed, before uh, we were born on earth, and whenever God created uh, the earth, but there's different views about when Satan fell, but let's just assume it was uh, before the creation of man. 
money was not an issue and yet the evil of Satan was there so we can't say money is the root of all evil because then you have a, an improper understanding of things that's why it says all sorts or all kinds or types and it's in reference <clears throat> to people and so by putting the word sorts or kinds in there it certainly clarifies that meaning and is is, is fine to do I would uh, put it in italics though so they know that it's not an original word but it's implied in the context okay okay well good I think that's all I got <clears throat> okay oh excuse me oh man there's a good yawn oh all right okay sounds good muy goodo yeah yeah I appreciate it thank you Matt <laughs> all right man well God bless I'll talk to you okay. soon all right we'll talk to you later Bye -bye. okay well, we have nobody waiting right now. If you want to give me a call, we have, uh, well, we only have about two more minutes left in the show. And um, tonight, I'll be on uh, for a couple of hours on the uh, being interviewed, I guess, or discussing, I guess you could say, on the ministry called Answering Adventism. They have that on YouTube, and there's also answeringadventism.com. So, let's just say I'll just give you a heads up Adventism has all kinds of problems in it some very serious problems we'll be discussing it tonight and I'll be learning some stuff because these guys are the experts and I don't know why they're having me on uh, maybe because I know my theology pretty well and we can run things by it and discuss various things so who knows but it should be interesting and they do a lot of videos they have over 150 videos there and I'm looking for uh, other stuff. I'm like, oh, they're mission and beliefs. Oh, interesting. I'll check them out. So anyway, that's what's going on. All right. Um, I hope you had enjoyed the show. And please remember to pray for uh, Chuck and Patty about the issues that we talked about here five minutes ago or ten minutes ago. And also, just want to let you know, we stay on the air by your support. Please consider supporting us. All you have to do is go to carm.org forward slash donate. We ask five, ten dollars a month. It's not a whole bunch. We get enough people doing that. We can make budgets. We can do things, and uh, we definitely need a lot of help here at the intergalactic headquarters of Carm.org. All right, there we go. May the Lord bless you. There's the music, and by His grace, we'll be back on here tomorrow, and we'll talk to you then. And uh, have a great, good evening, everyone. God bless. Another program powered by the Truth Network.